Um, yes, this video will be uploaded uh, probably sometime tomorrow. Okay, so let me kind of back up and tell you the background of this class and why I think you'll find it helpful. Some of you who've been coming to the training room for several years remember the Abundant Agent training classes and then the Momentum training classes. Those classes um, were intended to teach you an intentional and proactive approach to your business. Intentional, I plan my work. Proactive, I work my plan. If you are intentional and proactive, your success is assured. Or you're not just being proactive, you're not just trying to do stuff, right? It's random, it's not necessarily the most effective or most efficient. But you're not just planning, right? Because if you just plan, 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 you'd never make any money. But if you combine planning with activity, particularly activity that's based upon a plan proven to get a particular set of results, your success is guaranteed. So in those classes, we taught vital activities lists. How many of y'all remember how many vital activities were on our seller list? Or our buyer list? 26 or 33? Almost there. We call them the 47 vital selling activities, the 47 vital buyer activities. I used those for some time, and then as I gained more experience as an agent, I began to customize that list to how I actually did business and incorporated my tools and processes into that. What I'm sharing with you today is the current version of my home selling task list or my personalized vital activities list. Yours will not look like mine because you're going to customize it for you. That's why I've gone ahead and I've put it on back agent at this address so you can do that. Um, before we get into the nitty-gritty, let me share with you the seven broad categories that appear on my list. The first is to consistently offer my professional services to preferred sellers. Ooh, is that a little better, easier to see? Mm -hmm. Originally, in the Momentum classes, we called this Find a Seller. And that is exactly what it is. We're, we're prospecting in our primary lead sources. Uh, Paul, just grab a couple of these chairs. Right. No, no, no. Glad. Hey, I love a full house. All right. <laughs> uh, this is awesome. Hi, everybody. We'll Hi. put chairs in the hallway if we need to. So this was originally called Find a Seller because you don't need a task list if you don't have a seller, right? So, um, but I changed the name from find a seller to consistently offer my professional services to preferred sellers because I actually show this list to my sellers. And I don't want them to feel like I've gone out and hunted and, and shot and dragged them back to my camp. You know, I found one, I got one. You know, so I, I phrased it a, a little more seller friendly. And then I have just listed here my six primary seller sources. I, I know, for example, this year in my business, I'm supposed to close 36 transactions. Approximately half of those are going to be sellers, 18 sellers. Where are those sellers coming from? Well, I actually know in advance because I am, what am I in my business that would let me know in advance where they're coming from? Working a plan, yeah. I am intentional, mm -hmm. right? I have a plan. So I don't just expect stuff to happen in my business, I cause stuff to happen in my business through my plan and my proactive approach. So these are my six sources. My two geo farms, my local sphere, my Remax referral network, my BNI group, and my Toastmasters group. So I have a specific strategy within each of these sources. That's another class. But I just acknowledge them on my task list that this is where it all begins. I have to find one before I can service one. Now, the second major category, listing conversation. What actually happens when I am speaking to a seller? And let me figure out how this is going to work. There we go. So, Frank, you said you show this to your seller. Yeah, I'll show you why. As we okay. go through this, I'll set it in context and, and it will make sense for you. Okay. So this, is a, this list we're looking at right here is all the stuff in the second section. We are still in section two about what we're doing at the actual meeting. Now let me go down to page four. Um, we go into the third section, the administrative preparation. This is after I've taken the listing, what happens next. Then the marketing of the property, here's where I earn my money, right? Part of it. 
It's not all marketing. Some of it's, some of it's negotiation. Some of it's just client servicing. But here's what I do in marketing the property. It's still all marketing. Then we go to the fifth section, present and negotiate offers. Here's the strategy that I use on that and the specific tasks that are involved. And then we get to the sixth section, closing. How do we make sure that that goes smoothly and it generates additional business for me? And then finally, the seventh section is post-closing activities. What do we do after the sale to maintain that relationship and leverage that relationship to generate additional business? Not just repeat business from that client, but additional referral business and business generated from marketing of that successful transaction. Okay, so you got the big picture? Mm -hmm. All right, those are the seven sections. So let's go ahead and dive into this. First of all, you'll see that I have gone ahead and listed some basic contact information for the sellers. Name, seller one, seller two, name, email, phone, kids' names, birth dates, and pets. Now, I want more information than that about my sellers, but this is the basics to get started. So I'm going to walk into the listing conversation with as much of this completed as I know. And if it's repeat business, I may know all of it. But if it's somebody that was generated from my geo farm that I haven't met yet, I, all I may have is the property address and one of the seller names. So I'm going to go ahead and, and get the rest of that information while I'm there at the appointment. And this will help me. By the way, I have a hard copy. And I use this as my checklist throughout the transaction. So I have one of these for every single seller transaction. And I just follow it right through. So I don't talk about this section with the sellers, but uh, I get that information. Now let's get to section two. Let's go ahead and dive in when I actually have received an inquiry or gotten a response from my marketing efforts to a potential seller. I set the appointment. It's a good start, isn't it, Ann? Very good. Set the appointment. While we're on the phone setting the appointment, I ask my pre-listing questions. How many of y'all do this? Get as much information as you can before you go out to meet with them. So, how did you hear about me? I want to know what marketing efforts produced this result. So I can track it back to a source and a strategy. Those of you who do business planning with me know that I'm on my third or fourth business plan already for 2016. That, that poster I have on my wall, that's the third poster I've had printed this year. Why would I do that? Because you see what's working or what's not. That's so right. Change I'm consistently shifting resources to what's generating results. I don't worry about what's not working. I don't throw additional resources at what's not working to try to fix it and figure out and make it work. I, it's not working, and this is, I'm going here and I throw more resources at it. So I, I need to know, why are they moving? Timing to the move, do they have a survey? What is their approximate loan payoff? And here I, I need to explain to them, because that seems kind of personal, doesn't it? But what I say is when we get together face to face, I'd like to be able to share with what you what you can expect to walk away from financially from this transaction. And in order to make that calculation, I need to know approximately how much you owe on your current mortgage. Okay, So understand. if they understand that, they're willing to share the information. Do they need to buy or lease another home? Uh, I get the phone and email address for all the owners. Boy, this is going to drive me crazy. There we go. Um, have there been any significant updates or improvements to the home? I need to know that because I'm <laughs> going to create a CMA on this property before I go in, right? In my case, it's a quick CMA, but I'm going to establish a, a range of values. But I'm going to do that based upon sold homes that are comparable in that neighborhood. But those are just numbers. I don't know what kind of upgrades or amenities they've done. I don't know if the thing's been torn apart by renters. So I'm going to ask them up front to give me their opinion <coughs> about any upgrades or amenities or condition that I can use to adjust my range of value before I show up. Um, I inform them that they will be receiving social media connection requests from me, which will assist us in marketing their home. Hey, just so you'll know, I'm going to be sending you a Facebook friend request and a LinkedIn connection request. That's going to help us in exposing your home to the marketplace. So when you see those requests come through, please accept them, and that will put us another step down the road. And by the way, having their phone number and email address and proper name helps me do what? 
Find them on there. Find them on social media. That's exactly right. Okay, so then, this is, I've asked the pre-listing questions, we've set the appointment, we're off the phone. Now I immediately send the friend request and the connection request. I then add the sellers to my databases, and I use two. I use Apple Contacts, um, and I put a, a smart tags, or I put them in smart groups. If you use Apple Contacts, you know what I'm talking about. In the notes section, you can put it seller, client, Toastmasters, whatever source or information you want. And then when you do a search in your database on Toastmasters, everybody in that group will show up. It's not creating groups, but, but smart tags. So then I also put them in my referral maker CRM. Um, that is the CRM produced by who? Buffini. Buffini. That's a Brian Buffini. Are you what, using it? I just went to it. Yeah, I just did. I just bit the, uh, bit the bullet, bought the product, um, and so far I'm really happy with it. I was trying to run my business this year so lean that I did not want to pay for any single product that I could get for free. So I tried to use uh, Gmail, I tried to use Apple Contacts, and all of them had significant limitations that I learned after several months of effort. And so I finally just bit the bullet and bought a, a real deal CRM. And I, I really, really like it so far. How much is that? Well, if you pay a year in advance, it's about 30 bucks a month. You can pay 360 for the year. Otherwise, it's like $50 a month. Um, I uh, confirm appointment 24 hours uh, prior to the appointment. I, I ask that they have two spare keys available for the lockboxes. Uh, by the way, why would I need two keys? Because you're going to lose one? Back up for the oh. box on the back of the and house. And for you to keep whenever you sell the house and it's a lease property. <laughs> <laughs> it's like sneak in whenever I want to. When the agent wants away the keys. Really? Nobody knows. For the back door. Oh, the inspectors and stuff that don't have the super, so you put it on the combo Bingo. box. Bingo. I use two lock boxes, so I need two keys. Super on the front door for high security realtor access. We track who's coming and going. But do the appraisers have super access? Not always. What about the plumber, the electrician? What about <coughs> when the homeowner loses their key? Do I want to drive over there every single time there's an issue? What if the, what if the realtor trying to show the home with a hot buyer that their, their battery goes out or the super box battery goes out or that super is so deep in the alcove that they can't get a good signal and can't get in? All kinds of, you get technology, you get issues. So I always like to have the mechanical backup and I explain this to them, you'll see. I explain smart, that to them right? in the conversation. Smart. I learned that from smart people. I didn't invent that, but it has <laughs> saved my bacon many times. You got the super on the front door, you put the lockbox like on a... I put the uh, combo on the back gate, mm -hmm. so it's not obvious. And I hate walking up to the front door and seeing two lock boxes on there. Mm -hmm. So I put that on the back gate. Nobody needs to know about it unless they need it. Okay. I remind them to have the survey available, and I confirm that all owners will be present for the appointment. Okay. Um, that's in the confirmation call. Now I'm getting ready for the appointment. I'm going to preview uh, uh, previous listing data to determine if room measurements are available. Why would I do that? Same time save time and I hate measuring rooms. Mm -hmm. I just do. So if somebody's already done it for me, bingo. Okay, I'm taking it. Um, research and find information to be used in the MUD and HOA notices. Why, why would I do that instead of just ask the buyer's agent to present those with an offer? Why am I going to that trouble? So you don't have to wait for them to not send all the documents together. They have everything you get it in one shot. That's a That's good reason. You get it in the back agent. That's you get paid. All these are good reasons. Give me the legal reason. What is a MUD notice? What is an HAO, HOA notice? Disclosure. Whose disclosure? Seller. Seller disclosure. It is a seller disclosure. Mm -hmm. It aggravates me to no end when I present an offer and the listing agent says, hey, where's the MUD notice? Didn't you get that prepared? Didn't you prepare the... I'm like, are you kidding me? That is a seller disclosure. Um, now, if it's the HOA and I'm the buyer's agent, do I mind preparing it? No. Why? Because you're going to have the seller pay. That's right. I'm going to write the terms favorable to my client. But that's not how it should happen. And let me share this with you. In two weeks, I'm going to teach a class called the 10 Biggest Contract Fails. I've been working on that for over a month, and I've already got 20 contract fails, so I'm going to have to rename the class. <laughs> but there are so many issues like that that 98% of the agents out there do not understand, and that's one of them. On these HOA and MUD notices, listen very carefully. Are you aware that Trek says if those notices are not provided in advance of signing a contract, the contract is void? 
voidable, voidable by the seller, um, by the buyer. Hmm. The, there's the, the buyer is supposed to have those in hand before a contract is entered into. So listing agents, do your homework. Assemble your pricing tools. Quick CMA is what I use. Buyer full report on the most comparable properties. I establish a preliminary range of values. I prepare a net sheet and probably three net sheets. Low, high, and mid so that when I actually get inside and can judge uh, amenities and condition as well as seller motivation, I've got a net sheet all ready to go that shows them approximately what they're going to walk away from. I prepare the listing documents and as much as I love electronic documents and I use Zipform and DocuSign on every contract, I take hard copies to the appointment. Appraisal district data sheet, information about brokerage services, the TILA, listing agreement, MUD notice, HOA, uh, notice of information from other sources, the RSC disclosure, T47, and then the seller's disclosure supplemental and exclusion list. Um, I've had um, agents tell me that they, if they do a pre-listing package, they send the disclosures in advance. And I think that's fantastic if you do that. I have not been able to consistently maintain sending out a pre-listing package, just as a practice. So I take it with me. But if you can have them do it in advance, that's fantastic. And then my home selling task list. I print, the, I print this list and I include it in my documents. And I, all of these I stuff right inside my personal brochure and that's what I walk in with. Okay? I assemble my listing tools, my sample marketing materials, past flyers, that type of thing. I put a yard sign in the back of the truck with a coming soon rider, a sold rider, and a Texas Sentinels rider coming soon in case we're not going to put it on the market immediately. If we have to do some landscaping refresh or a, a, a little bit of cleanup and we're not going to actually activate until next week, I'll go ahead and get the sign in the yard put the coming soon on there. I leave them, uh, you'll see this, They're, I leave all three riders with them so they can swap them out for me. I now, if we're going to go on the market that day or the next day, I won't use the coming soon. I'll go ahead and put the Texas Sentinels rider on there. And if you wonder what that is, walk right past my office. I've got it taped on the door. It says Hero Home. Nobody knows what that means, so they have to ask me. Great opportunity. And I explain that I make a contribution out of my commission from every sale to support mortgage-free homes for wounded warriors. And I make that point to my sellers at time of listing. And then when we review the CDA at closing, and it lists on their Texas Sentinels, I'm able to explain again. That's a contribution that... I am making. Okay, and it always makes a great conversation. I get my electronic and combo lock boxes, uh, my flyer box, my one to four family contract. Ooh, what is that? What is that used? What is the one to four family? The buyer. That's the offer contract. Right. So why would I take that with me? They get familiar with it. That's exactly right. You don't want them to see that for the first time when a buyer makes an offer because there's a lot of information on there. So I'll take that with me and I'll explain it uh, during our listing conversation so there are no surprises. I take my personal brochure, uh, my lock boxes, my preferred vendor and consumer resource list. How many of y'all have a preferred vendor list? Oh, oh. I hope I'm never <laughs> you what? I hope I'm never up against you at a list. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have to like, bring dinner or something. <laughs> um, yeah, get a preferred vendor list. I cannot tell you how often I use mine. In fact, I have it linked on my website. I could, that way, when somebody asks you got a plumber, I say, yeah, go to my website. It's right there. Um, but I take this with me. Why would I take a preferred vendor list with me to a listing appointment? So you can prep the house. That's exactly right. We're probably going to find some stuff that needs to be done, and they're not necessarily the ones to do it. So I'm like, well, great. I got a guy for that. I got somebody for that. Here we go. Um, note, I clean the sign panel and post and inspect the hardware before I go out. Um, if you put a sign panel out very long, what happens to it? Dusty and dirty. Uh, dusty and dirty, and the birds love them, right? And I use those white aluminum posts. Oh, it just runs right down the side. <laughs> so I actually carry Windex and uh, white cloths in my truck. And I clean them before I go, and then I clean them again when I set up. And when I drive past the listing two weeks later, I stop and I polish them again. Okay, And I make that point as part of my pitch when I'm talking to sellers, is that every piece of marketing that I produce for that home is going to reflect in the piece the quality of that home. Everything from the yard sign to the flyers to the video, everything is going to be top quality. And if necessary, I'll point out the yard sign down the street. That's an old, flat, rusty, wrought iron frame in the ground. It looks like it got run over by a tractor. And I say, when I see a sign like that, I think that's what the inside of the house looks like. 
I want to make sure that when people see your sign, they think, wow, I want to see what's inside that house. Okay, It's part of my pitch. I may not sell my houses faster, but it gets me more listings. Uh, preview the most comparable homes to establish a basis for comparison of condition and amenities of subject home with the competition. I typically do that in the hour before the listing appointment. I'll find the most comparable homes in the neighborhood and I'll set preview showings. Are you aware you can do preview showings? <laughs> I taught this class yesterday and some agents didn't know that. Uh, preview showings, go and see them. I'll just give you a quick, quick oh, really, really fast example. I took a listing two weeks ago and uh, it was in a neighborhood I never sold in before. It was a big house, had a very unusual floor plan. I had done my preview showings and saw that you know his and her master closets, butler pantry, some other, other very unique features. Then I go to see my seller, who I met for the first time. He's touring me through the home and he's pointing out all these odd features. And I'm like, oh, oh no, no, I'm, I'm very familiar with the floor plan. That's good. This is my first rodeo. That's good. Right? Oh, I, I know this floor plan. I'd only known it for 15 minutes, <laughs> right? I love it. Right, but but talk about just the difference in confidence, mm -hmm. confidence on the part of your seller in you, when you can make those kind of comments, and then and then as they're pointing things out, you know you can compare them to the other actives in the neighborhood right now. Okay, yeah, this is the same floor plan as the one over on Rampy, but uh, we've got a pool and they don't. Okay. You know, you've got quartz countertops, uh, they, they've got the base granite, okay? <laughs> You're like a genius. And it's just because you spent 45 minutes previewing uh, the competition. Arrive on time, take a compass reading to determine which direction the home is facing. Why would you do that? Some people might Yeah, a lot of people ask. It's, 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 it's not required, but it does ask. Mm -hmm. yeah. Who is it important to? The buyer, where the, the shade's going to be. Uh, uh, many buyers care, Asians care because of feng shui. It's very important to the luck of the home, which direction it's facing. Indians. And who else cares? Indian, Indians. Indians? Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Asian, yeah. I think, okay. Um, and um, your photographer cares. Oh. When, when do you want to take the exterior photos? Oh, that's good. When the sun is on the front of the home. You ever look at these exterior homes? Mm -hmm. You can't even see it because it's dark because you're taking into the sun. Mm -hmm. Okay. So take your compass reading, lead the listing conversation, uh, start with a tour of the home. Don't even sit down yet, you know, put your stuff on the kitchen table, but, but hey, would you show me around? You can build rapport with them, you can assess the condition as you go through, and find points of commonality to, um, to raise their comfort level with you. Uh, then you're going to sit at the kitchen table for conversation, you're going to set the tone. Those of you who've been through our listing conversion class, you're going to see a lot of this, and if you want more detail on it, just watch our listing conversion videos that are on our YouTube channel. I want to uncover their needs, prioritize their needs, review the pricing information. We're going to agree on a listing price. We're going to review the marketing plan, which I put on the back of my personal brochure. So when I carry in my packet of stuff, it's right there on the back in full color. Um, so it's real easy to access. We agree on a listing date. We review the listing documents page by page, paying very close attention to the first page of the listing agreement, which talks about land improvements and accessories. Why would we do that, by the way? Fix the price. What? It will affect the price. Uh, well, yes, absolutely. It enters into the price. Things they want to exclude? Uh, we'll come to that. That's a secondary reason. The primary oh, reason survey. is... Oh, survey. No, no, no. Okay. The land improvements and accessories are what make up the property. And the property is what they're selling. They think they're just selling a house, right? They don't realize that in the contract, it says that that house includes the drapes. That house includes the garage remotes. That house includes the mailbox keys. Did you know that? Yeah. It's on the first page of the contract. That's why, first of all, you need to read very carefully that contract so you know what it says, but then explain it to them. They may think they can pull that bird bath out of the backyard, right? Because hubby bought it for her on their 10th anniversary. It's not attached. It's not screwed in. It's not cemented in. It's just sitting there on a the block. Why can't they take that with them? Okay. So you need to know what it says and make sure that they understand what it says. Explain each of the seller's disclosure, especially the seller's exclusion list. 
and make sure the sellers understand how window treatment security systems and cameras and TV mounts are treated. And I just put those in there because those are kind of the big items um, that, that people get in disputes over. Ask if the sellers paid a deposit to obtain their mailbox keys. If so, put the keys on the exclusion list. Otherwise, they won't be able to go get their deposit back or we're, or back, or we're going to create a dispute with the, um, with the buyers. Sign the listing documents. Establish a plan for obtaining the completed disclosure. Sometimes we'll fill them out right there. Sometimes they need to gather some additional information. Get the survey. Review the one to four family contract, the offer contract, so they'll understand its provisions when we get an offer. Review needed improvements to get the home ready to show and sell. What do we need to do? Clean the garbage out of the garage, repaint the utility room, whatever it is. Declutter the countertops. Create a plan and a timeline for doing so. Get agreement on that. And then I share my preferred vendor and consumer resource list um, in case they need some of those vendors. I, this is what I personally do. I offer assistance with clean service landscaping, handyman, or staging. Basically pick one. I'm going to pay for one of those services. And basically, I explain it like we're in this together. And I'm going to share in the cost of getting your home to show and sell beautifully. So if they need landscaping refresh, I'm going to pay for that. If they need four hours of handyman, I'm going to pay for that. If they need a stager, I'm going to pay for that. By the way, my max budget is $250. But for that, I can provide any one of these services. Landscaping, handyman, cleaning service, all of that. So uh, I never tell them my budget is $250, but I know because I have my vendors in place, it will cost me no more than that. Okay? So they and, and that typically blows them away. Really? You're gonna absolutely I'm gonna write the check. And I've got the I've got the vendor who'll take care of it for you. Um, I show them my home selling task list, here it goes, for their home to set expectations of what I will be doing throughout the process. By the way, what do they think I do throughout the process? Nothing. I put a sign in the yard, and then I go get my commission check at closing, mm -hmm. right? So I make a big deal of flipping through all six pages, fine print list of everything that I'm doing. I don't read it to them, but I just say that I, I want you to know that starting tonight, I go to work on a comprehensive marketing plan to find us a buyer for your home. I'm gonna negotiate the best possible deal. I'm gonna supervise the paperwork process. I'm gonna negotiate appraisals and repairs as necessary to ensure that we have a smooth and productive closing. And here's just some of the stuff I'm gonna to do to make that happen. I've just set an expectation in their mind that probably is a paradigm shift. They didn't know we did all that. And so when they call me and I don't answer the phone, they have, well, gosh, he's probably working on page four. Okay, there's some <laughs> sense that I'm not just waiting for the check. Okay, um, I explain why I use the super and the combo. Um, I explained that uh, I can provide them with free home warranty coverage through the listing period. Absolutely free, no obligation. Uh, we schedule time for photographs and video, and I do my own photographs and video, but I have professional grade equipment, and I've been doing it for many years, and I know what it takes to produce a professional grade product. Uh, if we've got good light and they're ready, I'll take them right then. If not, I'll schedule a time to come back, and I will do that when all parties are present. I want the whole family there if possible, including the kids and the dogs, right? And I want the sun on the front of the house. So sometimes if it's, if it's an eastern facing home and they're not available for the evening, it will be a double trip. I'll have to go take the pictures of the exterior in the morning. Okay, but I'll do that because I, I, I want to sell their house for top dollar and present it beautifully. I instruct the seller what to do with the listing fire, flyers when they arrive in the mail because I'm not going to deliver them to the house. I'm ordering them from a professional printer who's going to ship them directly to the seller. So I'm going to set the, the, the flyer box while I'm there. But I say, when they come in the mail, they'll be here in three or four days, put 10 of them out in the flyer box and keep the rest in the home. That way, if we get some kind of monsoon or some vandal, some kid in the neighborhood, we don't lose all of our flyers. And, and, and I, I order $50 worth with every listing because $50 is the threshold with my vendor for free shipping. And I'll get about 80 or 85 of them for that price. Um, and uh, I've never, uh, never run out. Did you say you use quantum? I do use quantum. 
Yeah, and you'll see I, I create my flyers in Design Center, and Quantum Digital is the built-in, it's one of the built-in vendors, so it's just so easy every time, create the flyer, you know, preview it, and then hit send to Quantum, and, and then I just play with the quantity to get the to fifty dollars and one cent, you know, <laughs> so I don't so have to. So you're not doing color flyers inside a black and white Snickler box? No, no, and I explain that, and I differentiate myself from agents who do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And I, I just don't run off cheap copies on the office copy machine. You know, I do professionally printed, full bleed, laminated cardstock flyers. You know why? Because your house is worth it. Ooh, I'm sold. Yeah, your house <laughs> is worth it. Right there. Okay. So different. You always look for points of differentiation because they think we're all alike. Mm -hmm. And you, you went at the end of this meeting, you went to thinking, wow, I, I've never dealt with an agent like this before. Okay, so always differentiate. Never, never make fun of other agents, but, but let them know that there, there's a difference, okay? Um, ask them if they're aware of anyone else who's thinking of buying, selling, leasing, or investing. And you'll see this throughout my checklist, because when people are buying, selling, leasing, or investing, they have a heightened awareness of other people who are, and you want to start getting referrals, not just at the end of the process, but all the way through it. I give each of them five business cards. I ask them to keep them with them and share them with anyone who wants more information about their home or who has any other real estate question or need. Ask them to text or email me immediately with the contact information of anyone they give a card to. Because they could give out 500 of, their, of my cards and how many calls am I going to get? Probably none. Probably none. But if they give me one name and phone number, how many calls am I going to make? <laughs> I'm going to connect. I got a real good chance of not just calling them and catching them but taking their listing, right? Or selling my house. So. I want both ends of that loop closed. Uh, measure the rooms if necessary. Install lock boxes and yard sign. Take photo of clients next to yard sign with each of the signed writers. And I explain to them, we're going to take all of our marketing photos now for your home. Because once we sell your home, things are going to get crazy. And husband might already be working in Pittsburgh or the kids might be away at school. So we're going to get all of our marketing done right up front. So I'll successively take a picture with the coming soon, then with the Texas Sentinels, and then the sold. Okay? And then I'm good to go. Um, what do you do? You put a picture of them with the coming soon? Yes, yes, yes. Right? I'll show you why. You'll see why I don't get to marketing. What's your average time when you go out the first time when you're doing all this? What's your average time there? Yeah, about an hour. I mean, it's, it seems like so a lot. So you're making more. brisk time then. You're moving right along. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sometimes an hour and a half. Okay. Okay, but I want to I want to take these photos with children and pets when possible because I'm going to use these on social media and in my direct mail marketing, and uh, kids or dogs especially they'll increase my look time from about a nanosecond to about three seconds, and that's that's an infinite difference. Um, I leave the sold rider with the client so they can use it to replace the Sentinels rider when the home goes under contract. All right, because I don't want to drive out there again, just like replacing flyers. Okay, I don't want to do that. Uh, administrative prep. I send a thank you note and gift card to the referring agent or friend as appropriate. Again, a lot of business I do is referral, and I always put a, I write as soon as I take the listing, actually as soon as I get the referral and set the appointment, I'll write a little note, put it in a $25 Starbucks gift card, and send it off saying, hey, I'm looking forward to paying you that referral, or if it's one of my clients, thank you so much for recommending me to your brother. I promise I'll take as good a care of him as I did of you. Here's just a quick thank you for the referral, for thinking of me. Okay, $25. Um, I, forward the, uh, I scan the listing documents, I forward them to the seller via email so they have a copy of what they signed. Um, I save them all to the transaction folder in Dropbox, and, and I just, this is my system, 2016 client folder, seller last name, dash street name. I set up the transaction, upload all listing documents in the back agent, take photos and video when the sun is on the front of the home if I haven't already. I edit the photos and video, I create branded and unbranded versions of the video, why would I do that? For the sellers, one for sellers, one for marketing. No. Close. One for the MLS. Which would that be? <coughs> Unbranded. You can't put branded videos or photos in the MLS. But what would I use my branded for? Social media. Social media. And Can you, you define what you mean by branded number? It's got my name and contact information in it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's it. What uh, application are you using to do the video? You're shooting it with your cell phone or the camcorder? You know, I've been using my Nikon SLR, 
which is just a, just a basic, not a high end, just a basic SLR. You put a strap around your neck and you push it out tight and you walk around like a zombie like this and it really steadies it out. And then if you edit it in YouTube or in, um, in, in the Apple iMovie, uh, wherever you edit it, they always have stabilization features and so I'll stabilize it even further and, and come up with a great video. Mm -hmm. I edit all my photos in um, Pixlr, P-I-X-L-R.com. It's a free online service. I, I use free editing software for both the video um, and for the photos. What do you use for video? I... Well, I, I actually, I, I mentioned YouTube. I don't use them to do the editing any longer because if you edit it in YouTube, the final product stays on YouTube. Mm -hmm. So I'm now using iMovie because when I upload to social media, i.e. Facebook, I want a direct upload. I don't want to do a YouTube link because then they have to push the button to see the video and then a YouTube window opens up. I want them as they're scrolling through their news feed to come down to my post and the video auto plays. Mm -hmm. And so to do that you have to do a direct upload. How long is it taking you to say to create a, a movie and I is it iVideo? iMovie. Or iMovie. How long does it take from the time? It, it doesn't take me long because I don't do a lot of editing. I don't do cuts and splices and all that. I shoot one video. I literally, I start in the yard with my camera, and I start narrating, and then I go through the front door. I've already turned all the lights on and opened all the doors, and I just narrate as I go. Um, and so my editing involves stabilizing the video. I just hit the stabilize button. That's it. Uh, it doesn't work for me. And then I'll trim the, the front and the back so I'll have a smooth open and a smooth ending. That's really all I do. I might add some text if I need to put the address on there if I want it. I, I don't, it's not complicated. I don't, I do it all very simple. Then I save everything into my media folder within my transaction folder on Dropbox. Okay. Marketing, number four, this is where it gets exciting. I post the photo of the sellers with the yard sign in the coming soon rider. That's presuming that we're coming soon. If not, then I just do the Texas Sentinels rider. I, sh I put on my business page, I share from there to my personal page, I invite the sellers to like, comment, and share on their personal page, and I just learned this this week, to gain the highest rates of interaction, post 7 to 11 p.m. Wednesday through Sunday using 40 characters or fewer. That's based upon Facebook <laughs> analytics. Input the listing into the MLS. In private agent remarks, I put the broker name and license number. Why would I do that? required for the offer contract. Why make a buyer's agent work hard to provide that information? Actually, most of them won't do it. That's why most of these one to fours that you get have those lines blank. Okay, so just make it easy for them. Agents want to do business with other agents who make it easy. Have you ever steered your seller in a multiple offer situation towards the offer where you knew there was a reasonable professional agent on the other end of that contract? I have. Oh, but this is a REMAX agent. This transaction is going to go much smoother if we have a full-time mm -hmm. professional agent on the other end who knows how to get deals done. So I, I communicate in everything I do. That's who I am. Okay? Uh, I list my preferred title companies. I don't say, if owner pays owner title policy, use blank, blank, blank. First of all, that's a violation of your TREC rules, and I don't know why HAR is not enforcing that. The owner does not get to choose the title company even if they pay for the title policy. Who gets to insist on what title company is used? I mean, the buyer. Yeah. When? Under what circumstances? Every time. Contract. If they're paying. If they are. If they're paying. The only situation in which one party can choose the title company is the buyer if, if the buyer is paying for the owner's and lender's title policy. Otherwise, who decides? It's a negotiation. And that's why I don't say, you must or you better. I put in private agent remarks, we prefer. We prefer. And 80% of the time, my offer contracts come in with my preferred title company written in. And if it's something else, I don't make a fuss. Okay? I put out there our desire, and then we just let it go. Okay? When the listing goes active, post the photo of the sellers with the yard sign and the Texas Sentinels rider, and do go through the same process. 
Upload all disclosures and supplemental documents to the MLS. Send an email to Natalie Hinchelwood to set up seller coverage with Allied Home Warranty. This is the one that I know of that's absolutely free. Sellers like, you're kidding. Oh, that's just one of the things I do for my sellers. It's just one of the things I do. Upload the un unbranded video to the MLS. Upload the branded video to YouTube and Facebook business page. I boosted on Facebook for about $10 just to get some initial exposure. I uh, set up showing instructions with CSS, create the listing flyer in Design Center. Okay, we're flying. Wow, you're awesome. Uh, order my 80 <laughs> flyers from Quantum Digital. Uh, here's what I look for color cardstock, laminated UV protection. Where do you sleep? <laughs> Not often. <laughs> Where do you set these up? You set these up in uh, your flyers? Uh, you? Design Center, okay. Remax Design Center. Okay. Um, but I sleep better knowing that nothing has been missed. And this is what enables me to have that assurance. I prepare the marketing display for inside the home, and here's what goes in it. I solicit feedback from all showing agents. I call the seller each Friday morning to discuss feedback, share the new marketing initiative for their home for the upcoming week. Right, because they think I went to sleep after I put the yard sign. No, I tell them, hey, we're going to see if we can juice some things up this week. I'm going to throw some money at our Facebook marketing campaign and see if we can't get you some additional looks. Okay. And you bet when I do that, I call them because I get about one to two, I, I get a look for about every one cent, one to two cents on Facebook booths. So it's pretty awesome when I say to them, hey, we had 657 views on your home video this week on buyers that I targeted to be most likely to be interested in your home. They don't know I paid $6 to make that happen. Okay. Very impressive to them. And by the way, I met with a, an agent in San Antonio, the number one REMAX agent in San Antonio. I met with him a couple days ago. He's only been in the business four years. He's already got a team of 25 agents. He'll do over $50 million. Oh, he told me he's, he just did $12 million in one month. So I don't know. Wow. He's probably going to do $70 million. I don't know. But he told me, I can hardly believe this, but the guy, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a hero. He, he literally, he's a special forces. He was the only person who survived a combat operation, um, six months in a coma. He's, he's an incredible, true American hero. He told me before he started in this business, he said, I'm going to be the number one agent in San Antonio. And I'm like, yeah, well, I'm, I didn't say it to him, but I'm like, yeah, yeah, sure. You're a great guy, but there's some good people out there. Well, he's already number one Remax after four years. He'll be number one in San Antonio of any brand within a couple. But he told me he spends $250 each week to promote each open house two hundred and fifty dollars and he spends all of it starts on friday night for the sunday open house he crams it into that short window of space how many people do you think are showing up to his open houses mm. the average is two hundred what is he doing it on facebook <laughs> what does he spend the money on just the, the advertising advertising boosting he'll put several pictures of the photo and I put in here 40 characters less. He told me, he said, I don't buy that. He puts a lot of information in there with the photos and the time. And, uh, and of course, they don't just do the Facebook. They call all the neighbors in advance, and they warn them that there's going to be some congestion in the neighborhood this Sunday. Oh, I love it. Because we're holding an open house. Oh, my gosh. Right. So you're going to see there's going to be cars everywhere. But I'd love for you to come by and see the home for yourself. And, of course, what are they doing? They're generating additional... He said they get seven, eight buyer, solid buyer leads um, out of every single open house, new clients. So anyway, I'm just throwing that out there. I'm not about to do that. Gosh. All right, presenting negotiating offers. I respond promptly and warmly to all realtor requests for additional information. Promptly and warmly. I welcome those requests. I present all offers in a positive light. I don't care if it's a low ball offer. I don't want my seller to be offended. And so I simply say, hey, we got an offer. It's a little on the low side, but let me just share with you particulars. Um, obviously, we're not going to sell your home for this, but we know that the buyer is probably going to be willing to pay more, and at least they've started the conversation. That's what this offer is. They don't expect us to accept it, but they're just getting the ball rolling. And so let's, uh, let's play. Let's see how far we can go with it. Negotiate price and terms in the best interest of the sellers. Obtain signatures on contract docs. Ask the sellers to replace the Texas Sentinels rider with a sold rider. And now, up goes the photo again. 
Look at all the mileage we're getting. This is why we take all the photos of all the riders every single time. We're either saying, hey, check out you know, the house that just came on the market, or hey, we sold it. Congratulations to the Smith family, that kind of thing. At this point, immediately after contract, I asked the sellers to post a review of me on Yelp and Zillow, and I emailed them instructions on how to do so. Okay? Why would I do it now? Oh, that's great. Why now? Because they're high. They're happy. Yeah. They're happy. Things can go squirrely after this, can't they? You can't wait till after closing. You know, you can't wait. Stuff happens. Uh, sometimes you get to the end, you just you just don't like each other anymore. So, <laughs> you, good. and even if, agent on Zillow? what? Are you a premier no, agent? No, no, I don't pay Zillow anything. Um, provide the contract documents to the title company, upload them to the back agent, update listing status, MLS, CSS, confirm dates and times for inspections and appraisal. Please do that. Please confirm with your sellers. Don't get somebody shot. This almost happened to, one of my sellers almost shot somebody. What? She literally drew down on it. Wow. She got out of the shower, heard somebody coming through the front door of her house, wrapped a towel on, grabbed her 45, and drew down on the inspector. Oh, no. wow. Make sure all that's worked out. Negotiate the repairs. Here's a tidbit for you. You're representing the seller. You've agreed on repairs. You've got the amendment in place. Check the box that says the option period is now terminated. The purpose of the option period has been completed. Cut it off. Don't give those buyers two or three more days to wiggle out of this if something happens or they happen to see another home that they like better. Okay? Upload the repair amendment to uh, back agent Dropbox. If the repair amendment involves a seller contribution to buyer closing costs, send a copy of the amendment to the title company, otherwise they don't care. Instruct the seller to have licensed and or full-time professional vendors complete the required repairs and get me copies of the receipts. Why would I give them that instruction? What about cousin Billy Bob, who's pretty good with plumbing? Why can't he do the job? If he makes an error, it's gonna come back on him. I want the legal reason. Well, that's a legal reason, but I want the real legal reason. So they're not responsible? If it's done correctly? All those are good answers. <laughs> Here's the right answer. <laughs> the contract requires it. Receipts. Mm -hmm. no, the contract says, read the contract. It says, any repairs required under this contract shall be done by licensed professionals or those persons employed full time in that trade. Did you know that was in the contract that you signed? Take a look. So please do not write in special provisions or in the repair amendment all repairs to be done by licensed professionals. It's redundant. In fact, technically you get in trouble for that because you're never supposed to write anything in special provisions that's already covered in an updated contract or addendum. Okay. Upload the repair invoices to back agent Dropbox. Prepare copies of repair invoices to the buyer's agent. Provide copies. Uh, negotiate the appraisal if necessary. By the way, I've, I've tried several times to negotiate with appraisers and never had any success. I know some people do. I negotiate the appraisal with the, um, with the buyer's agent and try to reach an agreement. Number six. We draft a seller temporary lease or buyer temporary lease if necessary. Don't let anybody stay late or move in early without one of those. It creates tremendous legal problems for you and is a violation of the contract. Coordinate turn on, turn off of utilities. So there's no interruption of service. I can't tell you the number of situations we've been in where they close on a Friday afternoon. Seller turned everything off. The buyer didn't get to the water company in time and they're without showers all weekend. Okay, Coordinate that. Talk about it. Schedule closing with the title company and the coordination with the uh, buyers. Arrange for remote closing or power of attorney if necessary, if one of the sellers is not going to be there. Submit the CDA of the title company with the donation to Texas Sentinels. Coordinate the final walk for the buyers. Obtain a buyer walk and acceptance form from the buyer's agent, because it's required where? The Back agent. You're not going to be able to close out that contract without it. Uh, instruct the sellers to leave extra keys, manual, garage remotes in a kitchen drawer. Uh, arrange with the buyer's agent for buyers to obtain a key at or after closing so they can get into their own house. You don't want to lock them all up in the kitchen. 
And sometimes I'm perfectly fine if things are going well in this transaction for them to take the key out of the lockbox at the final walk and then hold it in their possession, give it to them at closing. I think that's fine. Uh, review the title commitment so you understand it. Is this passing with any encumbrances? You know, is the fence over on the neighbor's property? Is the, is the pool deck four inches into the utility easement? You need to know that. Okay. Review the master statement with the seller, arrange for disposition of proceeds from the sale, either a check at closing or wire funds to a bank account. Obtain a closing gift to present to sellers at closing. And I'm, I, I wish I had a better idea. I just go buy a $50 restaurant gift card from Kroger and write a nice note and stick it in there. Have dinner on me. Celebrate. So, uh, arrange uh, blah, 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 blah. Remove signed lock boxes and marketing materials from the home. I instruct the sellers to bring government-issued photo ID to closing. I attend the closing. I complete a friendship profile on each seller at closing. You recall I said I just had their basic information at the time I take the listing. My uh, Buffini referral, referral Maker CRM has room for all kinds of information. Favorite wine, favorite restaurant, bucket list items, uh, anniversary dates. So at closing, I, I present them with these forms and I'll quiz them. And I'll say, hey, I just want to stay in touch with you and maybe be able to reach out in the future on some issues that are of importance to you. And so I'll fill that all out. I'll get all the information that I can go back and put in my um, CRM and have, have detailed knowledge on potential touch points in the future that would be valuable to them. Um, if not obtained at time of listing, and there are situations where it doesn't happen, I'll take a photo of the sellers with the signed panel and the sold rider at the closing. I try not to take it in the closing room. Those are such sterile environments, but I'll take them outside, find some oak trees or palms or something like that. Um, and I, I try, if I can take it outside, I can use one of my reflective sign panels. If it has to be inside, I do have a polyvinyl sign that's not reflective. Because if you take a flash photography of a reflective sign, all you see is a big flash, okay? Or, or discolored sign panel. Uh, Post-closing activities. Update the status in the MLS and CSS. I print the sold status the MLS to PDF for upload to back agent. Uh, upload the master statement, uh, basically all closing docs to back agent and Dropbox. I post a photo, here we go again, um, of sellers with the for sale sign and the sold rider, the sign panel and the sold rider on Facebook, business page, share to personal, and invite them to share it on their personal page as well. And this is just a big celebration. You know, congratulations to the Smiths, we just closed on their home, etc. By the way, that's why I can share it on my personal page. I'm not advertising. I'm not merchandising. I'm congratulating. So anything that I share to my personal page, even if there's some business value, it's always done in the context of relationship. Okay? I'm not ever saying, call me if you'd like to see this house. Okay, that's not what it is. All right. Ask the seller if they're pleased with the service I've provided. Ask what they liked best and least about my service. Inform them that they'll be receiving an email request from HAR soliciting their feedback on my service. Tell them to respond since, or ask them to respond since their feedback is so important to my business. This is new. I just put this in because I had discontinued uh, doing the HAR ratings, but I'm going to re-implement that into my business. And so I've got my Yelp and Zillow reviews early on. If things go well at the end, I set the stage. Actually, they're going to get the email regardless. So I just set the stage and put them in a good frame of mind uh, to respond. I update the seller's address in the Apple Contacts and Referral Maker CRM, and I add the buyers to my databases. Why would I do that? Because I care about orphans, right? Yeah. And I know statistically their agent's going to abandon them. <laughs> Nobody should have to go through that. <laughs> you know, six months after the closing, they're going to think I was their agent. I love it. Right? Because they're going to hear from me consistently every single month. That Frank, boy, he's on it. He was great. Didn't you like working with Frank? Yeah, he was awesome. <laughs> he was awesome. Okay. So adopt those orphan clients. Okay, that's it. That's what I do. This is subject to change. I change it all the time. I change it almost every time I go through a transaction. I go back and I tweak something or I add something or delete something or consolidate something. But anyways, that's what I do. Um, if you came in late, I uploaded this document to back agent. <coughs> it's under documents, and it's just sitting there right at the top, and it's, it's called the Home Selling Task List. Uh, put it up in Word and PDF. I would encourage you, if you can, use the Word version and use it as a basis. Obviously, you're going to take my name out of it and all my vendors and all of that, but you can use that as a basis for doing yours. 
and you will sleep better at night, knowing that you have provided the highest level of service and nothing was missed. And by the way, after you do that, I would love to get a copy of your list mm -hmm. and see what you've put on yours that maybe I could learn from and improve mine with. Okay, any questions? Biggest aha of the day? All of it. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of good information. Frank, you've made me feel like crap now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Mission accomplished. <laughs> okay. So I hate to bust out of here, but I have another appointment. This happens every Thursday. I have to leave immediately at 11. So I look forward to seeing you next week. We're going to do buyer task list. Yes. And then we'll get into contract fails. I can't wait for that one. Okay, thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. You're welcome. Yeah.